Hi, I'm Goose, and welcome back to Color Theory and Minecraft. I took all of the Color Theory basic lessons and put them all into this one video for you for your viewing convenience. If you enjoy this, make sure you like and subscribe because I am going to be doing a deep dive series into some more info, some more examples, more details with all these principles. So if you like it, stick around, keep an eye out, and that will be out soon. But in the meantime, enjoy. See ya. So what exactly is value? Well, value is how light or dark something is. Higher value is lighter, lower value is darker. Value is easiest to understand when you're dealing with black and white and gray, but any color or hue can have value as well. We have blue, which is a low value, and yellow is a high value. Seeing value in color takes a little bit of practice. It's a little bit trickier than seeing it in grayscale over here, but we can make it easier by making the whole screen black and white. Out of what we have here, yellow is the highest value, and red is the lowest value. It's important to remember that everything we talk about here is relative. Now what do I mean by relative? I mean that everything changes in relation to something near it. So we have white concrete, which by itself is high value, and we have dark gray concrete, which by itself is uh, you know mid to low value. But if I put something higher value than this next to it, all of a sudden this is the lower value, this is the higher value. Same thing goes over here. This all of a sudden goes from the lower value of the two to now the higher value of these two. In relation to this, this is higher value. Now this means you can run into some kind of weird situations. So right here, we have black concrete, and in the middle we have white concrete. When you look at that, that's white. It doesn't get much brighter than that. But if we go over to snow blocks, which are actually higher value than white concrete, and we put that in there, all of a sudden that's a light gray instead of a white. Over here, because in relation to the black concrete, this is such a higher value, it looks white. But over here, the snow block is a higher value, so this looks gray. Now that center block is the same value in both situations, but in relation to what's around it, it is a different relative value. This can be useful in building if you want to have a block look lighter than it is. Let's say white concrete is the highest value block that you have, but this just isn't quite doing the effect that you want. Instead of trying to find snow blocks or something a higher value than the white concrete, you can make the blocks around it a lower value, and then those white concretes will look a little bit brighter. Now value doesn't just apply to the solid colored blocks that we're using over here. Every single block in the game is gonna have a different value. Now, I want you to build something, focusing on what we talked about today, and come share it on Discord. Link is down below. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, just a little project is fine. The most important thing though is to have fun and experiment and see what you can make. Hue is a different way of saying color or shade. So everything along the bottom is a different hue. Blue is a different hue than green. Yellow is a different hue than red. Saturation is talking about how intense or vibrant a color is. We have very high saturation on the bottom and low saturation on the top. Now it's important to remember that hue and saturation don't necessarily affect value. Remember value is how light or dark something is. For example, we have light blue concrete and light gray concrete. Now both of these are different hues and they're different saturations, but if we go to black and white, you can see that they're almost the same value. We use words like hue and saturation to describe the differences between specific colors. This can apply to groups as well as individual blocks. So right here we have four groups. We have red, cyan, orange, and yellow. Each one of these is a different hue than the other. Yellow is a different hue than orange. Cyan is a different hue than red. But the same principles apply to each one of the blocks in each group, because obviously netherrack and polished granite are not the same thing. For example, netherrack is darker, so it's a lower value, and the color's pretty intense, so it's a high saturation. Whereas polished granite is light, so it's a high value, but there's not a ton of color in there, so it's low saturation. This can be done for any one of the blocks in the game, and really anything you see anywhere. Now over here, I have a collection of red blocks. The redstone block right here is going to be my center of red saturation. This red that we have along the edges is as saturated red as you're going to find in the game. That is red. If we go to our left, we're going up in value, meaning it's getting lighter, and we're going down in saturation, meaning it has less color. If we go to the right, we're going down in value, meaning it's getting darker. We're also going down in saturation, meaning it has less color too. Something that is higher value and less saturation is a shade. Something that is lower value and lower saturation is a tint. Adding white makes a shade, adding black makes a tint. 
Now over on this end, we have polished blackstone. And at first glance, it looks like it's black and gray, but when you really get in there and look, you can tell it's mostly purple and a little bit of blue. This is a great example of how saturation is relative, just like value. Meaning in relation to the things next to it, it looks like it's black and gray and has no color, but if you really get in there and look compared to something that actually is gray, that's got quite a bit of color in there. Now let's say you're working on a build and you want to transition from yellow to blue. Usually the easiest way to do that is just to use green. But what if you don't want any green in your build? Well, messing with the saturation can help us do that. We're going to start with yellow and we're going to lower the saturation until we get somewhere around gray. High saturation, low saturation. And then we're going to go from the low saturation gray back up to blue. Now we have a transition from yellow to blue without any green in the middle. Granted, this is a pretty big gradient, but you can always pick and choose and just use a few of these. Like we'll try just the yellow concrete, sand, clay, and ice. That looks pretty good. We can even throw the blue on there at the end if we want. That's a pretty good gradient right there. So this series is a very basic overview of these principles. There's a lot that we didn't cover here, uh, but lucky for you, there are some other people that go very in depth. For example, here's a great Minecraft color wheel by Goopy25. And this over here is an awesome video by Nice Name on YouTube talking about color spaces in Minecraft. I really recommend checking it out. It's really, really interesting. But I want you to take just a couple principles that we talked about here today and apply them to a build. Do something small, little experiment, doesn't have to be too much. Um, but I'm going to put a link to my Discord down below, and you can come in and share it, ask some questions, say hey, whatever you want to do. I would love to see you there. Before we get into this one, I want to give a huge shout out to Snarple. If you haven't checked out his videos and his builds, go check them out. He is one of the best, seriously. But this video in particular, right here, had a lot to do with me making the video that you're watching now, and in fact, this entire series. So, go check it out, tell him Goose sent you, watch his videos, look at his stuff. It's great, you'll feel inspired. Do it. So what is local color? Well, if we look at the top of this crafting bench, there's quite a few different colors. It's not just one solid block. We got black, we got gray, tan, brown. But if we start zooming out, right here we have 1,000 crafting benches. You're going to see that it kind of starts to blend together. Now, local color is generally the average of all the colors that are included in the block or whatever picture you're looking at. So once we get far enough away, around here, we just have this orange-brown color. That is the local color of a crafting bench. Being able to see the local color of a block is gonna help you understand and apply all the principles that we're talking about much more effectively. Once you stop looking at magma blocks and shroom lights as magma and shroom lights, and just as different shades and tints of orange, it's gonna help your building a lot. It's one of my favorite sounds in the game. Again, for a much more in-depth description of all of this, go check out Snarple's video. I'm not going to rehash everything he said because he already said it, but I do have a little treat for you guys. I went through and made a reference image of the local color of every single block in the game. They're going to look like this one right here. We have a value reference on the left, and we have some color references on the top. And all of these are going to be available to you guys for free to download on my Discord. I'm going to have a link for that down below. You can hop in on the Color Theory channel, and it'll be right there, ready to go. So I hope someone can use them and enjoy them, and if not, you know, it's fun just to kind of look through and see how similar and different some of the blocks are when you look at them from really far away. So what is contrast? Well, contrast is the measure of difference between two things. Usually we see this with value and hue. For example, high contrast, we got black and white, or we have purple and yellow, but you can also have contrast in texture, have contrast in temperature, or contrast in size. Really anything that you can compare between two things, you can have contrast in there. A higher contrast means more of a difference, less contrast means less of a difference. So stone and light gray concrete are pretty similar, they don't have very high contrast, but black and white, we got a block of coal and a block of quartz, that's very high contrast. There's a term that I'm going to use a lot in this episode that I want to make sure we're on the same page about because it can have two different meanings, and that word is complementary. Now, complementary can mean that it goes together well. It complements it, like stone bricks and spruce logs. It's a very complementary combo. But when I say complementary, I mean opposites, in a sense. Black is complementary to white. Yellow is complementary to purple. Big is complementary to small. But that's what I mean when I say complementary. I mean opposites or high contrast. 
The most common place that you're going to hear the term complementary is when you're dealing with complementary colors. A complementary color is a color that is on the opposite side of the color wheel. So, for example, red is on the opposite side of green, orange is on the opposite side of blue, and yellow is on the opposite side of violet. A complementary color is the highest contrast option that you have for a given color. So for orange, the highest contrast is blue. You'll see a lot of companies, and especially sports teams, use complementary colors in their logos. This is because it gives them very high visibility, and they're easy to differentiate from each other. You also get some interesting effects when you have high contrast colors next to each other. It's hard to see on a small scale like this, so we'll bump up to a large scale like these ones. Now, as I move the camera a little bit and move around, pay attention especially to the checkered areas. You may see a little bit of a stutter, kind of a blending of colors. High contrast colors and values have a lot of movement when they're next to each other. Now, this can be good for visibility and for creating something kind of chaotic and busy looking, but it can also be kind of hard on the eye to keep looking at. Now, we have one over here that's low contrast, and you can see right off the bat, it's just easier to look at. It's not as harsh and straining as having high contrast. Your brain and your eyes are already primed to understand contrast in this way. If I take three blocks, got green, orange, and white, and zoom out a little bit, I want you to stare at that orange block without moving your eyes and try not to blink for about 10 seconds. Then I'm going to switch the screen to black and white, and I want you to pay attention to what you see once I remove all the color. Now, did it seem like those blocks changed colors even though it was black and white? What you were seeing was the complement of each color, the highest contrast and opposite. This is a little bit different when you're looking at a screen as when you're looking at something in real life, but it's the same principle. Changing contrast can drastically change the way that a build looks. Now, we have something here that's pretty flat, no depth to it, but it's all the same color. There's not really any contrast in this. Now, if we really bump up the contrast and value, it looks like it has more depth, even though it's still flat. It stands out more, it's easier to see the door, everything is framed really well. It looks a little better, it's a little more eye-catching. We get a similar result if we have contrast in the colors instead of just the value. Makes it a little bit more interesting, doesn't it? Contrast is a very useful tool to understand, and there are plenty of ways that you can use it to change something that you're building. And you know what that means. I want to see what you make using some of the principles that we talked about here today. I'm going to put a link down below to my Discord, and you can hop in there and share your build. I'm going to be sharing mine too. Ask questions, meet some friends, however you want to use it. I would love to see what you make. All right, so what is temperature? Well, temperature is a description of a color's placement on the color wheel in relation to the colors that are around it. Now, that probably doesn't help a lot, but it'll make more sense in a sec, I promise. Generally speaking, closer to red, is warm, closer to blue, is cool. So if we split these six guys right down the middle, we got cool colors and warm colors. But there are a lot of exceptions and you really have to pay attention to what colors are around it. This is when relativity really becomes important because what if we have something like this? Is that closer to blue or is that closer to red? Because if you're looking at a color wheel, purple is gonna be right in between the two of them. So is it warm or is it cool? It's hard to say if it's just by itself, so this is when we have to look at it in relation to the colors that are around it. So for example, if we have purple and orange, this is going to be the warm color, this is going to be the cool color. This is closer to red, this is closer to blue. But, if we put blue over here, all of a sudden this is the cool color, and this is the warm color. Generally speaking, you could say that these are both cool colors, but in relation to each other, we have cool, and we have warm. Now, things are going to get even weirder if we throw red right here. How do we categorize those? Well, we know that that's warm, and we know that that's cool. The weird thing is that we can say that the purple and the red are warm in relation to the blue. But you can also say the purple and blue are cool in relation to the red. So, things get kind of tricky. This is why paying attention to what's around it is really important and why I stress relativity so much, especially in temperature. I have some examples here that I hope will help clear things up and uh, maybe give you a little bit of practice. We have orange concrete and warped warp block. Now remember, closer to red is warm, closer to blue is cool. So in this case, the orange concrete is gonna be warm and the warp block is gonna be cool. 
Now we'll go to one that's a little bit trickier. They're both kind of close to purple and pink. But cherry wood is going to be closer to red, and amethyst is closer to blue. So in this case, amethyst is cool, cherry wood is warm. Over there, amethyst was the cool one. But over here, because it's next to something that is even closer to blue, amethyst is going to be the warm one, ice is going to be the cool one. See how that changes because there's something different next to it? Now this one's a little tricky. I want you to really take a second look at these and think which one is warmer and which one is cooler. Because the dead coral leans a little bit more towards pink and the tough block leans a little bit more towards blue, we have warm on the left and cool on the right. Just like I was talking about before, the value and the saturation don't necessarily affect the temperature. So even though these are both very low saturation and about the same value, you can still pick out a temperature between them. And that leads us to this little challenge. Think about all the things we talked about before, and in the comments, I want you to rate these from warmest to coolest. And we're going from the warmest color down to the coolest color. I have a bigger one over here, so it's a little bit easier to see the local color of each one of the blocks. And go ahead and rank these from warmest to coolest and put it down in the comments. I'll let you know if you're right, and if you're wrong, I'll tell you why. So you might be thinking, okay, that's cool or confusing, but how is that useful to my builds? Well, that's what I got these guys for. In nature, we have kind of an interesting relationship between light and shadow and warm and cool temperatures. They kind of act like opposites. For instance, if we have a warm colored light landing on an object, the shadow is going to appear cool. Same goes if we have a cool colored light landing on an object, the shadow is going to appear warm. Now, this is much easier to describe when you're looking at real objects, but for the sake of keeping it in Minecraft, we're going to switch to some shaders that do an okay job of replicating it. And there we go, we got shadows. If we go over to this one on the far left, the entire sphere is light gray concrete, but we're going to take some samples of it and look at them a little bit closer. We're going to look at this ledge right here and this ledge right here. I'm going to pull these up separate so you can compare them a little better, but you can see that where the light is hitting is much warmer and where the shadow is is much cooler. Now one of the reasons that this happens is because of what's called reflected light. Shadows act kind of like mirrors. Because the sky and the general atmospheric color here is blue, the shadows are going to reflect that blue and appear cooler. You can see the shadows down here, they're not just darker than the white concrete, they're also cooler. It's a little bit more blue, and that's just white. You can apply this principle even without using shaders. Now this sphere right here, I have it separated into the values of the shadows. We have the darkest ones down here, we got the highlights up top. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the shaders, and I'm going to show you how this replicates what we saw here. This is focusing mostly on the value, so we're going from light down to dark, but there's a little bit of information about the temperature as well. Try to keep these guys some of the cooler grays, and then we have some warmer grays in the transition. Now if we want to accentuate this even more, I have this guy right here. This is a temperature map of the values of the light and the shadow. I know that's a lot, but all that means is we have a warm light, so the colors are warm, and then we have cool shadows, so the colors are cool. Now you might be like, Goose, I thought you said that red was the warmest and blue was the coolest. Why do you have yellow up top? Well, there are two reasons for that. One is so that it's a little bit easier to differentiate and keep in line with the value, so that we still have high value going down to low value. But there's also something very interesting about the light system in Minecraft that I just figured out. Now I want to say that this is vanilla game. There's no shaders, no mods. This is just the basic lighting system that is in the game normally. We have the sun directly above, and this line of blocks casting a shadow. It's going to cast a shadow all the way down to the ground. I put some light sources on either side so that you can see the transition from light into shadow as the game portrays it. This is where temperature comes into play. As far as I can tell from some other tests that I did, the game assumes that all light sources are warm and all shadows are cool. So regardless of what you use as a light source, sea lantern, torch, redstone torch, it's going to start with warm light and it's going to transition into cool shadows. Something else that's interesting about this is that it has different kinds of shadows built in. 
Now you can see how it's a little bit darker right along the edge of the warm colors and then it kind of lightens up in the middle. That's called a core shadow and this is called a reflected shadow, a reflective light. First off, I think it's really interesting that they add that in so that the edges of all the light sources are actually darker than what's around it. But the temperature transition is what's really interesting to me. As far as I can tell, the light and shadow and temperature system in the game always follows these colors as a gradient in terms of temperature. We start with yellow, orange, red, and then the shadows are violet around the transitions and then level out at a cyan or blue color in the middle. I know those colors aren't super apparent, especially in the shadows, but they're very, very subtle changes. If you really take a moment to look at it, I'm hoping the recording translates it the same. There is a little bit of violet along the edge, and then the center leans a little bit more towards cyan. Make of that what you will, but I thought that was really interesting. I also thought it was really interesting that sea lanterns cast their own shadow and illuminate their own shadow. So you can see more of a straight line of that gradient right here. I haven't really messed around with this much, but I think there's a lot of really interesting things that you could do with this. I know temperature can be really tricky. It can be really confusing. Trust me, it took me quite a while to wrap my head around it too. But I really hope that some of the things here helped you understand it more. So this week, I'd like you to build something, even if it's just some color charts or some practice or, you know, a sphere like those over there, and come and post it in our Discord. Harmony is where everything that we've talked about so far really comes together. We're going to be talking about all the principles that we've covered and how you can use those to make things look good, make them look pleasing, make them have a good vibe, good aesthetics, good feels. For the most part, color harmony is subjective, meaning if you like how it looks, then good job, you're doing it right. But there are some basic guidelines for harmony that you can use as starting points and to get some good ideas to go off of. The first group we're going to talk about is achromatic. Achromatic just means without color, so black, gray, white. If you're building in an achromatic palette, you're going to be focusing almost entirely on value and the texture of the blocks. Up next is monochromatic. Monochromatic means just one color. In monochromatic palettes, you're going to be using variations of the same color, in this case red, to create your build. You're going to be looking at different values of red, different saturations of red, and shades and tints of red. Of course, you can do this with any color, we just have red here. Analogous color palettes use colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. Here we're using cyan, blue, and purple. You get more options and more variation with an analogous palette, but everything still works together. It's hard to pick a color that's in an analogous trio that doesn't work with the other colors next to it. Up next, we have complementary colors. We covered this in contrast, but just a quick overview. They're colors that are on the opposite end of the color wheel from each other. They give a lot of contrast, a lot of movement, but they can be kind of harsh to look at. Triads are a good way to mix complementary colors and analogous colors. We have very high contrast between each one of these, but there's not quite as much contrast as complementary colors, so you end up with a little bit of harmony. Like green and orange have some harmony, purple and green have some harmony, orange and purple a little bit more contrast. These kind of palettes tend to work really good where you want some harmony with one outstanding accent color. Tetrads are very similar. We have some harmony in there, but there's still some contrast between the groups. Tetrads are made of four colors that are on the corners of a square in the color wheel. In my opinion, these work best on really large builds or when you're splitting things up between, let's say, the ground and the building itself. Now, these are very basic palettes, and it doesn't mean that you have to be in one of these groups to have a good color palette. There are plenty of ways that you can make palettes that fall outside of these groups. If you think they look good together, then good. You got a good palette. But if you're looking at something you have and you're not really happy with it, but you can't tell why, it can be really useful to go back to these groups and see how the color palette that you picked fits into these groups. Maybe you have something that seems like it's an analogous color group, but one of them is just not quite right. Come back and think, all right, are these three next to each other on the color wheel or not? Maybe you can shift one of them a little closer and get better results. These are tools, but not rules. Your color palette doesn't always have to come from the local color of each block either. Sometimes you get really in there and you look at the individual pixels on the texture. We look at pods all down here, we got some green, we got some brown, we got some gray, we got some orange. It works great with all of these. Same with jungle wood. We have a little bit of orange, a little bit of green, something almost leaning towards gray. Works really good. Acacia wood, it's pretty gray, 
but it does lean towards orange. So that works well with the orange in the acacia wood, the orange in the jungle wood, and the orange in the podzol. This right here is one of my favorite color palettes right now. Over here we have deep slate, glass, and oxidized copper. I really like these, and I like how they work with each other, and I think the glass is actually what ties them together. The deep slate and the glass work together because of the contrast between the light edges and the dark edges, and it's clear, so it works pretty well with most blocks. But then we also have a tiny bit of green, tiny bit of blue around the edge of glass, and that ties in the copper really well. A lot of color harmonies rely on gradients as well. We have the green in the moss leading into the mossy stone, and we have that gray carried over with the iron bars, using the brown as contrast, but the brown is still a great harmony with green. These two work really well together. I think this is a very classic color palette. If you want to work more into contrast with your colors, you end up with some weird stuff like this, but it kind of has its own place, especially if you're looking at maybe underwater builds, something in a coral biome, or you just want something to look colorful and futuristic or weird or fun. I would love to see more people build with palettes like this. Color palettes can be tricky because they are so subjective. Just because you like something doesn't mean someone else is going to like it, and just because someone else likes something, you might think it's gross. This can make it difficult to improve because you might be looking at what other people approve of, or what other people like, or what other people are using. I really do think that if you enjoy your color palette and you like what you're doing, keep working with it. If you're having fun, go for it, and you'll get better. You might not think that everything you make looks great, but you should keep going with it if you like it, is a very important step in finding your own voice and finding your own style. So I want you to experiment a little bit. I want you to pick a couple color palettes, some that you make yourself, maybe make one of them a little weird, be a little bold with it, and make a small build with each one. See which one you like, see how you'd want to change it, and then make some adjustments. I'm going to put a link to my Discord down below, and I would love to have you come and share some pictures of your builds. We can talk about them, you can ask questions, see what other people are building, and I'd really like to see you there. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed having me tell you where the link for my Discord is six times in a row, but you know what? I would like to see you there. Uh, but like I said at the beginning, I am working on a deep dive for each one of these principles, so that will be coming out soon. So do make sure you subscribe because you don't want to miss those, trust me. Going into some really cool stuff there. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy whatever it is that you're doing, and I will see you later. See ya.